Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 1st, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why it appears Republicans on the House Finance Committee have given up on both following the law and trying to restrain spending. Second, we discuss how, like Democrats before him, Governor Dunleavy has started pushing spending without addressing who is supposed to pay for it. And third, we explain the fundamental and troubling inconsistency in NSTAR's recent statements about the Cook Inlet gas market. And now, let's join Michael. Brad, we got a lot of stuff to cover this morning, and uh, some of it I touched on yesterday. Um, I mean, I've got some, I think I had some haterade earlier on this week because I'm feeling a little angst and anger over some of the stuff that's going on. But let's um, let's get started. Let's talk a little bit here about the weekly top three. We got three big topics, and we're going to start off with a House Finance Committee. Um, and some members of the House Republicans, uh, House Republicans, that seem to get it, but at the same time they don't. Um, what what do you what, give me? Give me your thoughts on this. What, what are we starting with this? So I I think the the subheader for this segment may be with Republicans like these who needs Democrats. Oh, okay. <laughs> and and the and the and the number one on the list, number one on the hit parade is Representative Julie, Julie Colomb. Um, who said it, it, this all comes from the House Finance Committee hearings, which is why I thought you were playing the "I'm out of control" as the as the as the theme for the opener. But uh, Representative Colomb said in the um, as they were debating the PFD uh, during the uh, during the amendments portion of the House Finance Committee markup of the budget, she said, "I've always said <clears throat> follow the law or change the law." But it's clear we have two statutes kind of crashing into each other right now, said Representative Julie Colomb, an Anchorage Republican. False. <laughs> Just absolutely false. We don't have two statutes crashing into, into each other. The PFD and the POMB statutes are, in fact, in the same statute. They're in the same section of the code. And they work just fine together. They say that that you shall draw you 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 shall not draw more than but you can draw up to five percent of the of the value of the permanent fund for use in the general fund and then section B says a portion of that shall be used for uh, the uh, the PFD uh, section B is uses a different base uh, for calculating what the portion is. But it clearly says that portion shall come out of the POMB draw. And then section C, D, and E essentially say, C, D, E, and F essentially say you can use the rest of it for uh, the general fund, uh, but you can't go over the combined amounts between B, uh, the, the PFD, and the portion you use for the general fund can't go over uh, the 5% draw. That's what the statute says. There's no, there's no clashing going on inside that uh it's uh um, it's to me it's very clear and to others it's very clear and when you read the statute it's very clear about how that works what what representative cologne was doing was using that as an excuse this is an old bert stedman trick 
using that as, as an excuse for saying, oh my gosh, I've got to decide between these two competing, these two competing functions. And I'm going to come down on the side of this instead of on the side of that. And they're trying to set it up like they get to make the statute gives them the ability to make some choice between these, these two competing forces. That's not it. The statute says, if you're going to, if, if we're going to talk about this in statutory terms, and that's what her, that's what her comment was. If we're going to talk about this in statutory terms, the statute's very clear. You have a 5% draw, you take the PFD out of that and the remainder can go uh, for, for additional, for additional spending. What they don't want to, what she and others and Bert and others don't want to confront is that when you read the statute as it's written, what happens is you don't have enough of the POMV draw left over to pay for government. And so using the old Hammond formula, if you need additional amounts to pay for government, then you have to tax for the additional amounts to pay for government. They don't want to confront that because they don't want to talk about taxes. And so what they do is they turn it inward instead of reading the statute as it is, instead of interpreting the statute as it is, instead of applying that the, the Hammond approach as it is, they turn that inward and they say, oh no, we've got, we've got conflict going on here and we get to decide because we're legislators. <laughs> now, what the court said in 2017, what the, what the Supreme Court said in 2017 is you can tax PFDs. You can cut the PFD, you can choose to use the PFD PFD cuts as a way of funding the budget. But that the court never said there was a conflict. The court simply said you could do that, that, that the PFD wasn't constitutionally protected. It was like everything else. You could go and, and do whatever you want to with it in the appropriations process. But the court never said there was a conflict. And, and so you've got these Republicans, as I said, with Republicans like these, who needs Democrats? You've got these Republicans who are out there saying, oh, you know, we got to make a choice and we choose. We don't want to, but we choose on the side of all this government spending. Will Stapp, who, who is not my favorite. Uh, <laughs> Will, uh, you, you think that's an understatement? I was going to audio. I was going to cut the audio for this just to put drop it in there. Maybe I'll do that tomorrow. But yeah, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. This the Will Stapp thing is just ridiculous. But go ahead. Will Stapp, who is not my favorite, then, you know, doubles down on all this by saying, oh, you'd have to cut all this spending to pay a PFD. No, Will, you'd have to tax to pay if you apply the statute. If you use the fiscal plan that's in the statute, if you apply, we don't need a fiscal plan. We've got one in the statute if they just follow it. If you applied the fiscal plan that's in the statute, you would have to tax for all that, for all that additional amount, for, for all that spending that you went through the, the laundry list of. And, 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 but Will tries to turn it on his head, just like Julie tries to turn on his head, hit its head and said, oh no, we'd have to tax to pay the PFD. Wrong. The PFD is already paid for. The it's PFD, supposed to be first call, right? I mean, it's, it's in the language, original language. It's supposed to be first call on the budget. It's it, it, it is, it, well, it, it doesn't say first call, but it certainly sets it up that it is a call. And, and, and so the statute, the statute's already paid for the PFD. What you're wanting to do, Will, is get away from the responsibility of using the word tax. You're taxing, you're taxing the PFD, you're taxing middle and lower income Alaska families to pay for that government spending, disproportionately middle, hugely disproportionately middle and lower income Alaska families. You're taxing to pay for that spending, but you just don't want to use that word. And so like Julie, you ignore the statute. You say, oh my God, you know, we got this conflict. We got to make a choice. And so I choose, I choose government spending because that's good. And, and, and I don't, and I don't choose the, the PFD. It's, and then Delena, you know, Delena does not get out of this. Delena is the vice, is the, is the committee co-chair and responsible responsible for the operating budget, right? She's the one that brought it forward. And she sets this up. The operating budget sets this whole debate up by going out and picking a bunch of different funding uh, funding mechanisms, a bunch of different revenue mechanisms to fund the PFD. If she would have brought it to the committee as the statute applies and put, put the PFD as coming out of the permanent fund earnings reserve and saying, and now what once we're coming out of the yeah, coming out of the earnings and now we're out of the POMV draw. 
And now we've only got so much POMV draw left. We need revenues to pay for the additional spending we're doing over and above what's left out of the POMV draw and traditional revenues. Then you set up the debate the way the statute intends, the way Hammond intended, and it's taxes or CBR draws or excess draws out of the earnings reserve against that spending. As opposed to as opposed to the way they've set as opposed to the way Delena set it up, and 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 the way they debated it, which is which is all those additional revenue sources against the P, against the against the PFD, and then we get into this debate about oh what funding source are we going to use for the PFD? You know, and and Neil comes up with the with the with the tried and true trick that that Lyman and Burt uses over in the uh, in the uh, uh, over in the Senate of saying, oh, well, we'll increase oil taxes, which is a dog whistle. All that is, is a political dog whistle to the oil and gas industry to, you know, go go pressure your legislators, go call them up, tell them no oil taxes and, and you know, and, and do something else. And then they say, oh, well, we'll go for a CBR draw. Oh, no, we can't. We can't. We've drawn the CBR down too much. We can't do that. Or then we'll go for an excess earnings draw. Oh, no, we promised we weren't going to go over 5.5% in the earnings draw, you, you set up the PF, PF, the PFD against all of those other funding sources when you when you don't read the statute, when you don't apply the statute, when you don't apply the fiscal plans in place. And so with Democrat with Republicans like these who won't read the statute, who make up stories about clashing statutes, who say, you know, that it's the PFD against all this spending, or it's the PFD against all these other revenue sources, we'd have to excess draw, or we'd have to uh, excess draw from the from the earnings reserve, or we'd have to draw down the CBR. When you set it up that way, the PFD is always at risk and always and likely always going to lose. When you set it up the way the statute reads, then you see what's really going on, which is that it's all this additional spending we've layered on over the years that we don't have revenue for. Right. And, and we've got to go get revenue for it. Right. Well, it's because for years, the story has been, well, the state of Alaska has a revenue problem. It's never that we've had a spending problem. It's never that we've overspent and created new programs and created new dependencies and bolstered the welfare state and done all these things and paid for every secret pet project that every legislator has ever had. It's not about the spending. It's always been about the revenue. But for years, it was the spending. Now they've spent so much over so many years and created so much a dependency that the spending problem has become both a spending and a revenue problem. And and now they're just, and now they're just you know making up stories about clashing statutes to justify the way they're dealing with it, to justify taxing the PFD, taxing middle and lower income Alaska families uh, in order to uh, in order to pay for it. I, I, seriously, we, we, this this was confined at the beginning to Bert and Natasha over in the Senate who made up this story. Right. It's the leftover PFD. It's the you know, the PFD is is just sort of the the next savings account behind the behind the CBR or the SBR, it's it's it was Bert and Natasha, but now we've got now it's not just now it's not just Bryce and and Neil that's making this up. We got Delena making this stuff up when she brings the operating budget with with revenue sources for the PFD that are different from what the statute statute clearly provides. It's Judy Julie Colomb who was sold as a as a as a conservative. Julie Colomb, you know, saying, oh, it's clashing statutes, doing her best Natasha interpretation. And we got staff out there who's saying, oh, it's the PFD against all this spending. And we certainly couldn't, we certainly could, I, I could find savings in the budget, but I, I guess I'm not going to be able to. And so it's, it's the PFD against all, uh, all, this, he, uh, all, all this spending. But could he really, I mean, could he, you know, his idea of savings is immediately to cut the most visible high paying profile programs that let's just cut out all of department of corrections. And since we don't have any prisons anymore, let's cut out all the police. And since we don't have police and criminals anymore, let's just cut out the judiciary. And there's your $800 million. Hope you enjoy your PFD and your lawless society. I mean, that's, you know, it is, it is the most arrogant it is the most, it's a special kind of stupid is what it is. It's just, you know, it's the most arrogant thing that I could possibly think of. Basically what they're saying is you plebeians want us to cut the government, but we just couldn't do that because look at where you'd be. You'd be in ruins and in anarchy if we cut the budget at all, which is just a false argument all the way around. But, 
you know, hey, that's your lie. You tell it any way you want, essentially. Well, and Stapp, Stapp's being hugely disingenuous. I mean, Stapp voted for the, voted to override the governor's veto on, on the education bill. He voted to continue the big, big dollar spending uh, toward education. I, you, I, I mean, Stapp is all sorts of screwed up. Yeah. But, 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 you know, when it, when it infects Julie Cologne, when it infects yeah. Delena Johnson, we're, we're getting at people who claim to be well, rock rib fiscal conservatives. And, and I will say that on this program, we have said that they are conflicting statutes, but only because the legislature has chosen to see it that way, because they they continued to hold it up that way. We've said they are conflicting statutes. If you followed the law, hashtag follow the damn law, then you would it would be a whole different argument. Like you said, then the discussion would be around, here's the PFD, here's where it comes from, now how do you pay for all this other government? And who pays? That's what it comes down to. You're right. You're right. And I didn't see the Julie Cologne comment as as you did, because, again, we've used the terminology that they are dueling or competing statutes, um, but simply because that's how the legislature has set it up in their argument to say, well, we've got, you know, and you're right. If they laid it out and did it as intended, they would draw everything from the earnings reserve for the PFD and whatever is left over would be there for government. But then they don't have enough money. Then they would be forced to look for other buckets of money or they'd look for other revenue measures or something else would come in. But it's, you know, that's it's 100. You're 100 percent true in that regard. And that's exactly how Hammond set it up. I mean, Hammond said 50 percent for government, in essence, to to subsidize taxes, 50 percent as the PFD. And if you need more for government, then you should tax. Hammond wanted an income tax, but but at least you should tax for the additional amount you want for government. That's the clearly the way Hammond set it up. And he said, look, by doing it that way, we will hold down spending because people, re- legislators will not want to use the word tax. They will not want to say they're voting for taxes to fund government. And the, and the one trick, the key trick in here that's going on is when people use the term PFD cuts and that doesn't immediately, immediately trigger in your brain taxes. I mean, Matt Berman has, has laid it out clearly. He said, you know, PFD cuts are taxes. They are the most regressive tax ever proposed. But but when but you can use the word, Will Stapp can use the word PFD cuts. Julie Cologne can use the word PFD cuts. Delena Johnson can use the word PFD cuts. And people don't immediately click over to, to think of that uh, as taxes. And so they get away with it. But Hammond was right. If they'd have to use the word tax, if we applied the statute the way it was passed the way it's set up if we apply the statute the way that hammond intended the program all that laundry list that will staff went through would have to be paid for by taxes and 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 my guess and i think it's probably accurate that will staff would not vote for taxes to pay for a bunch of that stuff he would find a way to cut the spending if he had to use the word tax to pay for it the way the statute intends but by but by changing the terminology and claiming there's this raging conflict going on and claiming he's only siding, you know, with, with things that are necessary and, 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 and opposing the PFD or favoring PFD cuts by, by changing the terminology, he avoids having to say what he's doing, which is taxing Alaskans, taxing middle and lower income Alaskans to pay for, to pay for that additional spending. It's, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's frustrating. I mean, folks, if you're not feeling the frustration level here, um, you, you know, you're, you're, you're missing it because this is exactly what Brad and I have been talking about since 2016 is exactly this, this exact, uh, 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 avenue of approach. Uh, we've talked about the cuts. We've talked about all the different things that needed to be done. And yet here we sit in the same boat can't possibly cut. I mean, if we're going to cut, then we'll do the whole ridiculousness of sh- just shutting down all the Department of Corrections and public safety and the judicial, because that's the only way you guys would get your PFD, how greedy you are that you want society to collapse. That's the inference. The inference of his whole thing was how greedy you would be that you would want society to collapse to be able to get your PFD, all the while actually supporting a tax for a guy who's supposedly anti-tax. It's the same kind of thing. It's a tax on people. 
and it affects those in the, you know, it disproportionately affects the lower income folks more than anybody else. And uh, but, now, now that all the legislatures in the top 20%, I guess they just don't feel that as much. And, and Michael, we, we say lower income folks and people sort of go, oh yeah, but we take care of them other ways. The, 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 the thing we need to focus on is middle income, that we're taxing middle income Alaska families more through PFD cuts than they would pay if we, if we tax them more transparently, more directly. Yeah. It takes more money out and they're feeling it more than anybody. Brad Keithley, the weekly top three. We continue now. Governor Dunleavy apparently is now stopping, uh, is quit asking, you know, who pays and he's, I don't know. I read this article and it sounded pretty good, but the more that I thought about it, the more that I looked into it, it, it realized that really this is just an anthem for more government spend um, without any direct correlation on who ends up paying for it. And that's really, I think, what it's about. I mean, on the when you read this the article to begin with, you're like, yeah, yeah, he's hitting all the good points. And then you go back and you look at it and you go, well, wait a minute. It's ultimately, it's just more spend in the long run with no real consequences and no real accountability and no real anything else. It's just more spend, Brad. Yeah. This, this continues under the theme with Republicans like these who needs Democrats. We we've criticized repeatedly criticized Democrats uh, and, and independents on the show who uh, legislators who have written columns saying we need to increase spending. We need to increase spending for K through 12. We need to increase spending for childcare. We need to increase spending for, you know, this, that, and the other thing. We need to increase spending. We've repeatedly criticized them for not addressing in their piece, in their pieces, who pays? Who do they want to pay? Who, do they, who, do, who pays for that increased spending that you're uh, that you're that you're proposing? Now we got Dunleavy, who who doesn't want to spend the same way that the education infra the ed, the education industry wants to spend, but he wants to spend. There's there's two there's two sentences in here I want to point out. One is in the next, the lead off to the next to last paragraph. This is the Dunleavy uh, op-ed that's, that's making all the papers. It was in the ADN over the weekend, in the Fairbanks News Miner over the weekend. Um, but here's, here's what he says in the next to last paragraph. As the conversation around education continues, I will work with every member of the legislature to pass an increase in funding and needed reforms. But an increase the words right there, increase in funding. And then in the last paragraph, here's the first par here's the first sentence of that. Actually, it's the only, well, yeah, there we go. Rest assured, public schools will be adequately funded. Funded. So Dunleavy's out there saying we will have an increase in funding to K through 12. I want it my way, says he. I want it my I want it spent on the things I think is important. Right. But we will have an increase in funding and rest assured public schools will be adequately funded. Who's going to pay? We're out of money. We're, yeah. we, we have long since gone gone past traditional revenues plus the portion of the POMB that's available for government spending. Who's going to pay for this for this increased amount? Nothing. Just like when Harriet Drummond writes the column, just like when Elise Galvin writes the column. Just like when every other Democrat writes the column, Calvin Schrage, they don't put in who pays. Dunleavy's not putting in who pays. It, Alaskans, Alaskans are not being are not being helped to understand money doesn't grow on trees. They're not being helped to understand that this is a choice. You you want to you want to spend more here, you got to take more out of someplace else. Either reduce spending someplace else. Or you got to get additional revenues in, in the forms of taxes, either taxing the PFD or taxing some mm -hmm. other type of thing. They're not, they're not, th our leaders are not telling them there's a choice. They're just telling them money grows on trees. We all increase funding. I just want to increase my way. I'll increase spending. I just want to increase my way. And I, and, and, you know, Dunleavy has just gradually grown from this spending, I'm going to hold the line on spending. You know, first I'm going to cut spending. Then I'm going to hold the line on spending. And now he's just out there with the rest of them, with the, with the Democrats, just saying, well, I'm going to increase spending. I just want it increased on the programs I think are important. <laughs> That's the thing. I mean, he comes out and basically says, you know, um, 
yeah, I want to spend money, but I want to spend it my way. We're going to spend it, but we're going to spend it my way. Now, look, it's not that I don't disagree that I disagree with the governor wanting to maybe transform education into pushing more of the charter school model or getting more of that money actually out to homeschoolers and people who are doing good things. I think that's that's important. But the question we're spending two point seven billion dollars on education for one hundred and forty thousand students. I mean, th- th- that seems like that's a pretty significant amount of money, you know, and yet you want to increase it by another two, three. You want it? What are you? Three billion? Is that enough? Three and a half billion? And remind me again, Brad, what does a 10 year forecast say on the amount of revenues that we have coming in? And what does it look like over the next five years of that 10 year forecast? Revenues are going down. I mean, deficits are going up. Deficits going up. The spending increases. It's baked in, what, $150 million a year increase automatically. If nothing else, if a bomb went off in the Capitol and they couldn't hold session for two years, it would still go up $150 million a year. And they want to add another two, three hundred million on top of that. I mean, there is no PFD in five years at that rate, probably closer to three years. But, you know, we've taxed it out of existence. Julie Colomb and Will Stapp and Delana Johnson have taxed the PFD out of out of existence. And Dunleavy's right in there with them. I mean, Dunleavy, there's nothing in here about. And I'll hold the line on spending someplace else to make room for this, or I'll cut spending someplace else to make room for this. There's nothing about that. There's nothing about where the revenues are going to come from. There's nothing about where the offs. It's just I'll spend. I'll spend more. Just trust me. I'll spend more. That's what you want. I'll spend more. Just spend it my way. And I swear, we're going to end up this session where where we talked about it at the beginning where we're going to spend on increasing the BSA because that's what some want. And we're, and now we're going to spend more on, on Dunleavy's programs because the people who want to increase the BSA realize they need to increase spending to get Dunleavy to sign whatever bill they have. And we could end up at a, at a, at a half a million, uh, $500 million. We could end up at a half a billion dollars of increase by the time you layer on those two programs on top of each other. So it's the governor's no longer, if he ever was, the governor's no longer a conservative. I mean, the governor's just joined in with Harriet Drummond, with Elise Galvin, and with all the others who are writing these op eds about all about I want to increase spending. I want to increase it my way. But that's what the, that's all they said. They said I want to increase right. it my way. <laughs> and not just that, when you know, when they talk about, and this is I, I don't think this could be repeated enough, when they talk about the BSA, the problem is Um, You know, if you want to have a one time funding increase, that's one thing, because then you have to discuss it every year. And if the money's not there, you can ratchet it back, et cetera, et cetera. But if we increase the BSA, the base student allocation by a set amount, as proposed, the six hundred and twenty or six hundred and thirty dollars that they wanted to do it, that's a permanent increase to the budget. You are now encumbered on that every year, year after year for the foreseeable future. So another 250 million or whatever it is, uh, that whatever that works out to be 200 and something million dollars every year moving forward. Plus, you know, next year they'll come back and say, well, now we need a one-time funding on top of that. It's, it, it, I mean, it just, it never stops. And when the, when the, when the money runs out and it is running out, if you look at, I mean, the governor's own 10 year plan shows that the money is running out. When it runs out and there is no more PFD left to steal, left to tax, then what do you have? What's left on the table? Taxes. They're going to tax you. And I can, like I said, I can already hear it. Well, you Alaska, you've had a free ride for so long and you need to pay your fair share now of all these state services. Now that we've bilked you out of the permanent fund, et cetera, et cetera. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, no, no. And and the governor's right in there, Michael. I mean, these programs that he wants, I want to spend it my way. I want to spend it, but I want to spend it my way. These programs are permanent programs. I mean, the, the teacher, the teacher bonus is sold as a three-year program. If you believe that, I've got a bridge in Brooklyn that 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 I'm that I'm willing to part with for the right amount of money. It's it's it, it, these programs that the governor is proposing are permanent programs also. He's just, it, it's, there is no difference between what the governor is proposing and what Harriet Drummond 
and Elise Galvin and Calvin Schrage and all the others on that side, there's no difference except for what they want to spend it on. But they all want to spend. They just want to spend it their way. And none of them, none of them talk about how they're going to pay for it. And so the, and so the governor's walking himself right into, and he knows this, the governor's right, walking himself right into PFD cuts, additional PFD cuts. The governor who says, follow the law, which we could do, but the governor who says, follow the law is just walking himself right into deeper well, and deeper PFD cuts. And he's trying to be all things to all people. He produces a, he produces a, 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 you know, budgets year after year with a full PFD or a mostly full PFD or a 50, 50 PFD knowing that that's never going to go anywhere because then his later rhetoric goes right back to what you're saying. Well, we're going to increase the spend knowing that there's not enough money to pay, you know, based on his formulas and everything he's laid out that there's going to be, you know, a, a struggle to pay the PFD. And yet at the same time, he says he wants more government services. Where is the fiscal conservancy on that? Where is that? Where is it? it it's just not there. <laughs> it's, it's just not. Can't find it's it. Not. It's like I've lifted up the couch cushions. I can't find it anywhere. It's not. I mean, it, it, at the beginning he was, and 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 just now he's not. I mean, now he's just he's he he is the same way as Harriet Drummond, as Elise Galvin, as Calvin Trage. He's just you know spend more, spend more, spend more. Uh, just spend it my way. Spend it on the programs I think are important. You know, I was in education, says the governor. I was in education all those years. I know how to spend this money. Let me spend it. And and you know we got and the education the education industry doesn't want to spend it that way, but I know how to spend it. it but there's no debate about spending. Everybody's all in on the spending. It's just it's just you know it's just the way that it's spent. And there's no paying. Right. This right. Is all this is all free money. <laughs> we, it, we, again, we all get to spend. It's the revenue thing. We've got a revenue problem. We don't have a spending problem. We've got a revenue problem, which is what they've been saying for. 15 20 years almost we've got a revenue problem in this state <laughs> really you mean you've got a state government that can't live within its means it continues to grow uh, uh uh ben carpenter adds in the chat room he says we've added 654 state positions and over 600 million in personnel services over the last five years willful ignorance can't be educated away i mean that i mean we've added We've we've been in recession, pandemic, everything else. Six hundred and fifty-four positions. There you go. That 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 does it right there. And will uh, and will and will staff can't find any place to come. <laughs> you know? No, can't do it. Can't can't do it. Can't do it. Brad, um, don't you feel tired? I mean, just, it's, <laughs> it's, it's like I, you know, this whole time. I mean, I. I remember the first time that somebody told us on the program that, you know, what we really have in this state is a revenue problem. And I just looked at him and said, what? I mean, it, it, we don't have a, we have a spending problem. And that, I mean, that was back when the state budget was like two and a half, three billion dollars. And, and, and I'm like, this is not a revenue problem. I mean, we're, we're pulling in gobs of money. This is all prior to the whole Palin, you know, uh, excess monies, $150 barrel oil. And I'm like, this is not a, we are just trying to be all things to all people. You've got all these programs and how many programs have been instituted since then? It's the, it is the, it is, it's, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. Yeah, you know, re remember Michael last year, last year, just last year, Bert saying if we go to POMB twenty five seventy five, if we give the government seventy five percent of the POMB and only limit and limit the citizens to twenty five percent, we'll be fine for a long time to come. Just last year, that was now, their fiscal plan, right? I mean, that was Gary Stevens. Our fiscal plan is the seventy five twenty five. That's our fiscal plan. I refused. When, I refused to say seventy five twenty five. I refused to put the government share. 25, first. Yeah, yeah. But but I mean that was that was that was the plan, and we were and we're going to be fine for a long time. We'll have a surplus. Remember the whole surplus. Now Bert had a had a hearing in Senate Finance. Tim Bradner's got a piece on it in the Frontiersman. Bert had a hearing over in Senate Finance that said, you know, we're going to be it's really tight this year. <laughs> Because we got all these additional programs that we've already passed. The senior benefit program, Julie Colomb's 
you know, child care program. We got to increase. We've certainly got to increase K through 12 spending. Um, we've got all these additional programs that we've got fire suppression, which we, which we do need to do. We've got all these additional expending items and it's really going to be tight against 2575. I mean, where, where, where the, the money just goes away. It just disappears. I mean, everybody's got a plan. Everybody's got a plan for right. how to increase spending. Nobody's got well, a way for how to pay for it. And look at the fervor that happened when the house produces a budget that's 60, that's what, 60, 33, 67 or whatever it is, where the, 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 it was just a minor change, just a minor change. And everybody got their panties in a wad over that. Uh, now the, the Senate rumored that they're going to hold on to the capital budget because they're so upset about it. I mean, but in the end, they're all going to agree to spend more, more money, M-O-A-R, more money. But not of theirs, but not out of their pocket, since they've no. all but since they voted themselves an increase into the top twenty percent. Every last one of them is not coming out of their pocket. It's going right. to be coming out of middle and lower income Alaska families. I mean, that's the that's the whole. I mean, Hammond was right. Hammond said, "Look, if you're going to spend more than than the fifty than the traditional revenues plus the fifty percent from the from of the of the earnings draw, if you're going to spend more than that, make it taxes, make it hurt, so people push back, and and an income tax. I mean that, and part of that was to was to catch legislators, make it hurt in your own pocket, in every other state, every other state, legislators have to pay out of their out of their own pocket." a material amount in order to, it, it, for, for increased spending. They all have to go home and check their own budgets about whether this is really a good thing for them. That acts as a constraint on them, increasing spending. Only in Alaska have they found a way to target the tax on middle and lower income, on middle and lower income families in a way that legislators don't have to pay. So when we say more, more, Spend more is not coming out of theirs, their pockets. They don't have any constraint, any personal constraint. They're not feeling any personal effects out of that additional spending. It's just more of somebody else's money. I'm just thinking, what happens when the music stops? What happens when there is no more money and all those musical chairs are out there and I could see them shoving each other off the chair to get to that final chair to sit down to be the one that, you know, and some of them are just going to leave. I mean, some of them are already planning on leaving, uh, you know, some of them already spent half their, their, their time in the sunshine state, you know, sunshine somewhere doing their thing, just waiting to pull the plug and get that juicy retirement out of the whole deal. Uh, you know, it, it's, and, and we've set it on automatic pilot by passing by passing all of these programs, not one time spending by passing all of these programs. As you've said, we've set it on automatic pilot that it's going to push us right into that. It's going to yeah. push us right into that, into that, into that era, because there's there's been no constraint. There's been no personal responsibility that that, that causes legislators to push back. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, our guest. The weekly top three continues. This is number three, and it's a question about uh, oil and gas. Um, uh, Brad says there's been some inconsistency in what we're hearing in the public from people like John Sims over at NSTAR. And I have some questions about this because uh, I'm starting to wonder if there's a game being run on something <laughs> that we're talking about here. <laughs> The legislature running a game? Oh my! No, God. I mean, I'm wondering. I'm wondering if the industry is running a game on what's happening here. But you, you give me the. Let's talk about this inconsistency. What's going on? All right. So, so Sims gave us John Sims, president of NSTAR, uh, brother-in-law to the Binkley family, by the way, that owns the ADN. If you ever see any traces of of, of op eds in the in the Binkley family blog about this, um, John Sims of NSTAR gave a speech to the Resource Development Council that was captured in a Petroleum News article. Uh, and the headline is, Sims, not, Sims says, not price, but market size preventing more gas development. And, and, and what, this, what this reports on is a speech by Sims where he said, look, it's not price that, that's holding back 
uh, development, the price of gas, the price we're willing to pay for gas. It's not price that we're willing to, that's holding back development. We're willing to pay more. It's the fact that when producers develop additional supplies, they don't have a market to sell it to. And so they need all this royalty relief in order to, in order to, you know, incentivize them to develop these supplies because they don't have, they don't have a market. Here's, here's the thing. Royalty relief is, is an aspect of price. When, when a, when a buyer offers to buy gas, the buyer, as, as we used to do in the lower 48 all the time, when a buyer offers to buy gas, the buyer can say, look, I'll pay you a certain price and I'll reimburse you for your royalty and taxes. And, and so, and so I'll pay as part of the price, I, the purchaser will pay for your royalty. And, and, and if that's, what's really holding back producers because they'd have to pay royalty out of the, out of, out of whatever NSTAR is paying them, NSTAR can overcome that easily by saying, I will pay you an additional factor to cover to cover your royalty as part as part of the price. So there's there's an inconsistency going on here. If producers are saying I need royalty relief in order to produce, Sims could easily say as part of the price I'm willing to reimburse you your royalty, which is essentially royalty relief. Sims and start taking on royalty relief. Um, I'm re willing to reimburse you your royalty as part as as part of the price and if that's truly what the producers are concerned about that should resolve the problem it is a price problem but but the producers are saying no 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 i need royalty regardless of the price what sims is saying the producers are saying is no 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 regardless regardless of whatever price you're trying to give me i need royalty relief on top of that i need an additional subsidy on top of that even even John, if you're offering to pay me to reimburse me for my royalty as part of the price, I need royalty relief on top of that. So I'm not, that's just, I mean, to an old oil and gas lawyer, that's just a fundamental inconsistency of what's going on in the market. What may be going on, you may have other questions, but what may be going on is Sims isn't willing to pay that additional, that additional amount to cover their royalty. And so the producers are saying, well, if I can't get that additional amount from you, I need it from somebody else. I need the state to waive royalty. I need the state to subsidize me in order for me to produce. And so Sims, Sims is in that context, Sims is, be, Sims is being disingenuous because he's not offering to pay the price it would take. What the producers are saying, the price it would take to bring forth that additional development. So he's saying price is not the issue except for the price you're asking me. Is essentially what he said. Yeah. It, so it, it's there's 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 something there's something odd about about this discussion, and there's something odd about NSTAR's claim. You know, basically what I, what I thought all along is NSTAR wants the state to subsidize them, but NSTAR doesn't want to come out and say, "I want the state to subsidize me." The producers are saying, "Look, it's going to take me, you know, twelve dollars or whatever, thirteen dollars to produce this stuff." You're not willing to pay me that. Sims is saying, I'm not willing to pay you that. And the producers are saying, well, there's another way to get it. And that is for the state to waive royalty. And so, and so I don't have to incur the cost of royalty. You don't have to pay me. You, John, don't have to pay me for the royalty. We'll just shove this cost. We'll shove that share of the cost off on the state. I, if I were going to guess, I, I'm going to guess that's what's going on. That, that NSTAR is trying to get the state to subsidize the cost of gas to them but they don't want to come out and say it that way. And so they figured out a way of articulating it so that it sounds like it's the producers who need, who need to, you know, trigger the, pr pr trigger the oil and gas industry, the dog whistle to the oil and gas industry sound, make it sound like it's the producers who need the relief in order to, in order to provide the supply. But that's not, I mean, and, and promote crisis to do it. Right. I mean, that's the thing never let a crisis go to waste. And this is the crisis point that they are focusing on and factoring in to try and get that. This is, am, am I reading that wrong? That's what you're saying? Yeah. 
So, somebody, uh, somebody. I mean, si physically, Sims is running out of gas. I, I the cooking is running running down on gas. I mean, depletion rates and all that sort of stuff. You're running, you're running down on gas. Physically, that's happening. But but Sims, I mean, the first says the first sentence says, um, "Is there a lot of gas remaining in the Cook Inlet?" Yes, NSTAR John President John Sims told the Resource Development Council on March 21st. Is there a lot of gas remaining in the Cook Inlet? Yes, NSTAR John Sims told the Resource Development Council. So yes, there's a lot of gas out there, but but producers producers don't want to produce it. Producers don't want to go develop it and produce it. They want a higher price for it. And it could be, Michael, that the that the that the, the 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 cost factors in the Cook Inlet are such that, and the finance factors in the Cook Inlet are such that they need a higher price in order to produce it. I mean, you that's how the market works. You need a higher price as you get toward the end of a toward the end of a of an oil and gas product in order to elicit more uh, oil and gas. Could be, but so if the gas is out there, the producers are willing to produce it if they get royalty relief. Then all Sims has to do is say, "Great, I'll reimburse you royalty relief." But but he's not he's not saying what the price he's offered them is, right. um, and I and I'm going to guess that somehow he's trying to skate by with a with a lower price and shift this burden, as I said, by getting right. the producers to say, "I need the additional relief." Shift this burden off to the state. Right, because the headline reads, not price, but market size is preventing more. So it's not the price, but again, he's not saying what price he's paying. Yeah, but, and, yeah. and royalty relief isn't going to increase market size. If it's really market size, royalty relief isn't going to do that. It's not going to create additional consumers out there. It's not going to It's not going to reopen the, the agrium uh, fertilizer plant. It's not going to reopen the LNG export plant. Um, it's not going to increase market size. So you know, saying that saying that it's market size is the problem, but it's royalty relief is the solution is 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 also inconsistent because royalty relief will not increase market size. So it's it's something's going on in there. And I and and if I were to speculate, having been in the industry 30 some odd years, having been in the Cook Inlet, you know, for for 10 years. If I were going to speculate, it's that they figured out that Sims doesn't want to pay the price. And it could be that the price he would have to pay is more than LNG and they want to cover that. They want to keep the Cook Inlet production going. So they want to cover the fact that it's going to cost more than imported LNG. That some they figured out that the price that Sims would have to pay is too high. And so they want to shove a part of that off on the state. Right. Because the they, vehicle and the vehicle for doing that is claiming prices. Because they see the big open checkbook in the state and they're like, well, somebody could pay for it and it could be them. Let's talk about that. That's that's what is that? Uh 90 seconds, Brad. Final thoughts for today. Well, with Republicans like these, who needs who needs Democrats? I mean, the Republicans have gone all in on the subsidy state. They've gone all in on the spend without caring who pays state. Uh, and it's showing up all over the place now. And so with Republicans like these, who needs who needs Democrats? It's, uh, as I said earlier, it's, it's a massive amount of frustration. It is so hard to watch, especially knowing that this whole thing was preventable. If we had just grabbed the bull by the horns or grabbed the brake on that train and pulled hard, we could avoid the, the, the bridge being out in that chasm. But it's rapidly approaching. It is what it is. We're all in this together, and that's the problem. And even the people who are out there crying for more government spend and more government spend, they, I mean, they're really the people that I feel bad for. The dependency state that we've created, that when the wheels finally do come off the bus and we are out of money and they try to tax us, I mean, a couple things are going to have to happen. Either they're going to create this huge tax burden on all Alaskans. And that's going to drive some outflow, which is going to be a never, that's going to be a, 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 a biofeedback loop, a, a negative reinforcement cycle that forces more people out of the state because they can't afford the taxes to live here. Um, or they're going to have to make some massive cuts right on the spot to make it happen, which I don't think is going to happen. I think it'll be taxes other than the other one. But one way or the other, the people who are the dependent, they're the ones that are going to get hurt on this. And and they can't see it. They just they don't see what's coming. They they you could you know slide rule it out. Show them the ten year plan. 
They can't see. It's like it's like they have willful blindness. These legislators who've been exposed to this stuff to say, have you seen the 10 year plan of what happens to the PFD in the next three to five years? Well, yeah, but that'll never happen. We're too big to fail. I, I've just. It, they're all it's going to hurt everybody. It's going to hurt them all. Michael, we're not in this all together. The top 20 percent, including now all the legislators, since they passed themselves the pay raise. They aren't in this. They see this as their benevolent, you know, uh, uh, leaders that are deciding what's just and what's not just. But they don't have to pay the, a share of the costs. Julie Cologne. Oh, we got these conflicting statutes. Notwithstanding the fact they're all in one statute. But we've got these conflicting statutes and I have to decide. You know, I'm, it really hurts me, but I have to decide that we're going we're gonna to cut the PFD so we can increase this spending. Does that hurt her at her $250,000, $300,000 income? No. <laughs> Does that hurt Elise Galvin at her $500,000 income? No. Does that hurt Will Stapp at his $150,000, $200,000 income? No. <laughs> we're not in this together. That's the problem. In every other state, to some degree, they are in it together. Legislators are part of the hoi polloi. They do have to feel this stuff personally. But in Alaska, we've insulated them by moving them all into the top 20%. So they're sitting there as, you know, godlike figures who get to decide between good and evil, but they don't have to bear any of the costs of it. I mean, another, th another way, another thing about this whole Cook Inlet deal that bothers me is who's going to bear the brunt if we end up subsidizing the producers by by you know buying them kit and bringing it in or by giving them loans low cost loans or by um uh, by you know uh, royalty relief if we end up subsidizing the producers in order to subsidize John Sims who's going to bear the cost of that it's not going to be legislators it's going to be middle and lower income Alaska families through P additional PFD cuts. If revenue doesn't come in, if we don't have revenue from additional production from the Cook Inlet, because we've given them royalty relief, where's that revenue gonna be made up from? PFD cuts. It's gonna come from middle and lower income Alaska families. So we're not all in this together. If we were, I think the results would be different. But we're sitting here, we've created a system unlike any other system, in the United States, we created a system where the legislators are immune from the consequences of their actions. Yeah, well, and the and the public sector is immune from what's happening in the private sector. The only state in the union where that's exactly what's going on. So they just don't care about what's happening in the private sector. As long as the industries that serve government are still there and bolstered up fine, they're happy with everything else. It doesn't matter if it's nothing but fast food restaurants and service companies. They're happy with that. That's that that makes it doesn't matter what the quality of life is or the living is or what the cost is to everybody else. That's they're fine with it. And again, the, the people that I mean, who I feel bad for are the people who have become dependency, some of the loudest voices for all that government spend, because they're the ones that are going to get hurt in the end. Because the rest of us will, you know, will either leave the state or I mean, it's, it's you know, I could just see it. If you drop an additional, if you've taken the entire PFD and increased the spending and built all these multipliers and these modifiers into the system where it just ratchets up every year. Eventually, you will drive everybody out of the state that doesn't work for government at one level or another. That's that's what's going to happen. And <clears throat> and then the people who are dependent are the ones that are going to be the most hurt in that regard. Yep. And it, it's it's frustrating. It's 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 insane. It's insanity is what it is. But. Well, it's but it's across the board. I mean, this this Cook Inlet deal is just another example of it. It's just another John Sims. I don't want to pay. I don't want to reimburse your royalty. So go go you know go complain to the government about that royalty, and you know make up some story like you know you don't have enough market. But but if you if you if the government will pay my royalty, then I don't really care about market, right? It's like just make up a story and claim a crisis and. And you go get that money 
out of the government because you all in gas, your lobbyists have a hell of a lot better flu influence than right. my lobbyists. Right. Well, again, it's it's the government picking winners and losers, and they always do a crappy job. They just always do a crappy job at it, and that's that's what we're seeing right now. Uh, and the people with the loudest megaphones, in this case, John Sims and the oil lobby and, and some of these other things in this instance of the Cook Inlet stuff, they're the ones that got the megaphone and the friends in high places and the family members running the local media. So what are you going to do? That's, you know, what are you going to do? All right, Brad, I got to go, man. Thank you so much. As always, it's good to talk with you. We will see you next week. Michael, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.